think we're on. Right, I think we're on. Let's see if everyone's joining. I'll just give everyone a minute to just join in. Okay, I think everyone's joining. Uh, everyone's joined the webinar now. Um, so I'm going to make a start. I can see someone writing in the chat, but I'll uh, yeah, we'll get going. Um, welcome everyone today. Uh, we've obviously got this webinar, which you know really pleased everyone could join. Um, we've we've essentially got a digital transformation for home and garden, um, which is. You know, we're going to go into a little bit of detail. We've got obviously a, a guest that I'm going to be speaking to on this um, webinar. Um, Jonathan, do you want to introduce yourself um, yep. to the to everyone on the webinar? Yep, definitely. Thanks, Paul. Um, yeah, so I'm Jonathan Bracewell. I'm head of digital at Jay Parker's. Uh, some of you may have heard of us, but we're essentially an, an online horticulture business uh, based in Manchester. Um, so I'm sure Paul will ask me a bit of a background with the company in a bit. Um, but yeah, essentially that's me in a nutshell. I've been here about three years now. Cool. Um, and for anyone that doesn't know me, uh, my name is Paul Casey. I work for an agency called Space 48. Um, I'm the head of account management. Uh, I've been working closely with Jonathan on the project. Um, good morning to everyone. Um, basically in this webinar, um, obviously we're just recording this for anybody who wants to watch this after. Um, and what we want to cover in this webinar is really the journey of how Jay Parker's have kind of overcome challenges, you know, different implementations around technology. And we just kind of want to use it as like a sharing um, platform as well to, to give you guys inspiration or ideas for how you might be able to improve your site in the future um, or even the strategy around the business as well. Um, we've obviously, um, as part of this, we've, we've got um, two great sponsors that we both work with quite regularly. And um, so we've got uh, Clayvu, uh, which is a search and merchandising platform. Um, and then we've also got Big Commerce, which is an e-commerce platform. So between Space 48, Jay Parker's, Clayview, and Big Commerce, we're, we're all kind of working together to bring you this webinar. So we hope you enjoy it. Um, in terms of the, there was 30 <coughs> early registrants. So hopefully everybody that was the one of the 30 early registrants would have got a, a brunch hamper um, from Elston and some. So I'll put the, the link to the website if you feel like you're missing out and you want to order one for yourself, take a look at that. Um, but yeah, thanks to everyone for, for joining this morning. We'll get into it now. Um, so Jonathan, do you want to tell me a little bit about Jay Parker's and you know, let's talk through the kind of history of the business so we can get a bit of context for everyone on the webinar? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so thanks again, Paul. Um, so Jay Park has um, been around, we're coming up to 90 years now. Um, so we're a third generation family owned business, um, second and third generation, Chris and Paul are still very much involved in the business day to day. Um, Paul is the managing director and, and sort of oversees the buying function of the business. Um, so we've been, yeah, as I said, around for about 90 years, uh, trading through some pretty difficult periods, which we were talking about just before we went live. Um, and um, predominantly, as with the majority of, of businesses within this industry, as in online horticulture, we started primarily as a catalog business. Yep. Um, and, you know, a lot of print, print advertising. Um, and that was really the case, I would say, up until, you know, uh, early 2010s. Yeah. You know, it was it, it, as a an industry we found, and, you know, I, I've worked in, uh, fashion and, and beauty beforehand it's it's a it's just an industry that's very very slow to react to change and i'd say uh very slow to react to digital chain uh, yeah. change uh, absolutely so we started to see the swing of um customers using the website we've had a website since around thousand um but again that the, the customer base was predominantly ordering offline we started to swing see that swing really around 2014 2015 um and the business really didn't have a digital a, a pure digital function 
until I came into the business at around end of 2019. Um, so essentially through that year, um, we sort of met with, with Parkers a few times uh, and discussed plans to essentially transform the business from a, from a digital perspective. Um, and obviously that would be from obviously an e-commerce. We can talk a little bit about CDP um, and also ERP as well. Um, yeah. And I, I think it's fair to say that, that all um, facets uh, that I've just mentioned there were, were outdated. Uh, they were very sort of resource heavy and they were costing the, the business time and, and money. So um, it wasn't just necessary, necessarily key for survival, uh, sorry, for growth, but I think it was necessary for, for survival, to be honest with you. Um, so when you came in, you were you basically, you were tasked with how do we take this business forward from an online standpoint as like an, an overarching. And I think I remember you saying that, that at that point, this was obviously this was pre-pandemic, right? So this was end of end of twenty nineteen. Yeah, so I'd, I'd essentially gone through um, stage of interview process uh, yeah. in summer. And yeah, obviously presented uh, a sort of a strategy document throughout that, and then right. accepted the role uh, and started uh, early November in twenty nineteen. So yeah, as you know, we were went into twenty twenty, and it was all sort of well and good. We were raring to go, and then March came around and, and sort of kiboshed our plans a little bit, or at least delayed them. So yeah. have you, did you, at that point, had you already kind of selected the technology that you're going to work with? Did you, had you picked the e-com platform, <clears throat> had you picked the ERP, you know, the CDP, et cetera, was that already in, in flight or did you pick that at a later date and come to the final decision? <clears throat> so the ERP was kind of penciled in. Yeah. Um, and that was primarily due to the fact that we, we essentially use Microsoft Business Central, which I think some people call it Dynamics or, I can't remember. He's had so many iterations over the years. I can't remember. Can't keep up. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so that was we we've we've you know we've got quite a lot of roots with them, and and I think the yeah. business is is relatively comfortable with it. Um, so the the move to e-commerce platform and recruitment of CDP was was really up for grabs, to be honest with you. Um, and we do have some quite specific requirements, yeah. Uh, which again we can go into in a, in a little bit later. But um, we went through full RFP processes um, uh, in terms of selecting an e-commerce platform, um, which we actually did with Space Forty Eight. Yeah. So we went through um, a recruitment process there, um, and then we also did a full RFP with a CDP um, as well. So um, it was it was quite a lot of work and. Um, it was really in depth, and I think it exposed quite a lot of things, um, you know, that were potentially wrong uh, or you know obstacle obstacles within the company. But yeah. uh, I think it was really positive to to do those quite complex RFPs and and, and kickstart our choices from there. When when it comes to the actual e-commerce platform itself, because I think that's kind of the golden question for a lot of people is which e-commerce platform is right for me. Um, we're we're yeah. an expert, as you know, we're an <clears throat> agency we're with. Magento, Shopify, and and with Big Commerce. Uh, yeah. But when when you were in that s selection process, what were the main reasons that drove you towards um, you know Big Commerce being the right right platform? Yeah. So I've I've worked with various platforms over the years. I think the the, the latest one that I, I worked with before um, Big Commerce uh, here was a bespoke platform. Yeah. Um, and in my previous role, it was <clears throat> Demandware. What, what, which became um, Salesforce. Yeah. Um, so for us, or for, for me personally, coming into the business, assessing really what was um, what resource we had to hand, um, and what resource I was essentially allowed to recruit. Yeah. Um, and had sort of, um, let's say, control over, but um, you know, it would would sit more within my team. That that yeah. really influenced the decision. So. You know, in essence, we've we had the the sort of the opportunity and the autonomy to to recruit uh, a digital team and a, yeah. a, a sort of a, a trade and a marketing team, um, but I didn't want a platform that was very dev heavy, um, and you know that's specifically why we we sort of went down the the SaaS based route. Um, the company around nine years ago had actually moved from the bespoke platform that I, I just mentioned before to Magento. Yeah. And it went it went horribly. Um, it was a really bad experience and left quite a bad taste. Um, personally, I, I know that you know that, that the company uh, wasn't well equipped for a Magento um, transition at the time, um, and yeah, I, I didn't think we had the, the sort of the dev resource in, internally to really make a Magento or a Salesforce or a sort of more dev heavy 
um, platform work. Yeah. Those those types, those non SaaS platforms, or you know, the, the more historic platforms that have been around for a little while, and, and BC been around for a while, to be fair. But I think a lot of those platforms you do need that bigger in house team, or you know, bigger IT team, or whatever it might be, to actually run the actual platform itself, get the most out of it. Uh, because you're managing your own software in, in some cases and you, and you essentially need to upgrade it and manage it and do all those things as well. So we always find it's good to have that right balance between the two. So obviously you're on big commerce and, and you've yep. been on big commerce for a while. You know, what were, what were the main challenges in that replatform project, do you think? And you can't say working with the agency because that's us and I don't, you know, we can't slag us off in front of all the <laughs> <laughs> I think, um, I think from a, um, from an integration perspective, um, and you know, again, not to you know, I'm not blowing smoke up, up here, but you know, the, the 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 transition from platform to platform was actually relatively, I don't want to say stress free. There was a lot of things to be considered, um, but you know, our, our hands were held very, our hands were held, um, and you know, it was it was a very very smooth process from an e-commerce migration perspective, in my opinion. Our biggest concern was our customers' reaction. You know, yeah. from from our perspective, we've got customers that you know have shopped with us um, longer than I've been alive. You know, and and as as I've mentioned before, the demographic that sits within this vertical is is quite opposed to change. Yeah. So moving a website that you know very much had it had its flaws, and it was by no way a modern e-commerce platform, but you know, it was relatively stable. It was relatively fast. Yeah. And um, I remember yeah. that actually. It was really like site speed wise, it was performing really, really well, for, like on the metrics, wasn't it? So that was a big consideration in the transition because we were like, wait a minute, we can't go backwards here. We have to try and maintain or, or, or improve. So, yeah, absolutely. And I think that was the biggest concern. You know, we, we were sort of going from something that was quite dated but safe and, you know, yeah. our customers knew it and they were used to it. And, we if it's not broke, don't fix it. <laughs> kind of, yeah. And, yeah. and you know, you 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 know, we went, we were going through it at the time where we were experiencing, yeah, anomalous sales, obviously through through the pandemic. But yeah. you know, a situation where the website was was handling it and it was making more money than it had ever made. Yeah. Um, so it was, yeah, it was, it was kind. Of, we did approach it with some trepidation. Yeah. And I think when we first went live, you know, some customers were a bit uneasy about it a bit funny about it but now we're really starting to see the um the impact of making that change and making that you know um, transaction process really really smooth we did actually i mean in the in the project we actually tried to keep the ux design quite similar to the original project we did try to simplify the elements obviously make it i think navigation obviously is still something that we we obviously want to want to keep improving on but mm. i think with regards to overarching kind of you know brand i think we kept very similar uh, look and feel we wanted to go quite similar but more functional and a bit easier to use across mobile devices etc so yeah i think in the project it was it was very much a case of because of the demographic let's not change too much let's not have wholesale changes to everything let's let's try and make it incremental improvements in yep. the roadmap once we go live as well um just a question uh, just came up in the chat then from Matt Rhodes. Um, mm. He's basically said, "What made you, what made you choose Big Commerce over the other SaaS platforms?" Out of interest, um, it was primarily due to um, well, it was two main things really. Um, first of all, personally, um, and some people may disagree with this. Um, but from an out-of-the-box perspective, I believe you get more out of big commerce than Shopify. I think obviously Shopify is great as a platform and it has progressed, you know, a, a lot since we did this RFP process, which yeah, was nearly two, two and a half years ago. But at the time we felt that big commerce offered more out of the box. Um, I also think as well that from a product perspective, um, our products aren't complex on the face of it they are actually quite complex in the way that we handle them. So the way that big commerce handles products, I think is was much more suited to to what we what we needed. But don't get me wrong, I think Shopify is a great platform. Um, but I think for our requirements, certainly, um, it, it kind of it pushed us toward big commerce. And not to go into too much detail about the future, but we do actually have a, a B2B website. Um, and we also think thought at the time, and we still feel this now that 
big commerce is probably better positioned to to uh, accommodate that function. Yeah, and I know Shopify are enhancing their B two B and wholesale side of things, but Bundle B two B, which is obviously the 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 third party that was acquired by Big Commerce recently, that I say recently, I think it was about two years ago uh, or eighteen months ago, that that's really helped us because we've we've historically as an agency we've we've been in the Magento space since two thousand and eight, so when you work with Magento, you know, Magento 2 and what you can get in the B2B with that, you get a lot, you know, and you can yeah. customize quite a lot as well. So comparing something like a Magento B2B versus B2B functionality on these SaaS platforms, it actually two, three years ago, or maybe even three or four years ago, it probably wasn't up to scratch, but I certainly think with that acquisition of Bundle B2B, it enables functionality quite quickly, um, yep. you know, without, without a huge amount of development investment now, Prior to that, everything's possible, but it's budget versus return or like complexity and then carrying the technical debt moving forward that we all we were always concerned about as an agency. Because mm. if you have, you know, if you do build highly custom sites, you've then got to manage it on an ongoing basis. It's not just the end of, it's not just the initial project. So yeah. Yeah, I think that wholesale um aspect will be an interesting thing to touch on a, a little bit later. Um, with regards to the discovery and the, you know, like the selection of the third parties and some of the people that we're working with, yeah. um, a big a big part of that, obviously, I know I know we've the, there are other third parties, but the the product discovery side of things is quite important. And you know, I think throughout that discovery process, we wanted to understand. Oh, I think it might be worth just explaining, like you know, product discovery and and how you wanted to look at search search and merch. Um, and obviously, we eventually selected Clavio as, as the partner. But you know, yeah. what were the things that you were considering at that time, because we describe this market, home and garden in general, as a considered purchase. It's something that people are going to come back maybe between five and like up to with some clients up to like twenty times. So we'll keep coming back to the site over a period of time to keep refining what they need to do coming back and maybe price checking or, or you know um, looking at delivery or offers or whatever it might be versus the competition if it's yeah. larger items or if it's you know something for the home um how, how did you go through that process in the discovery phase to to select the right search and merge partner so i think for us um on the um you know the, on the website before um i think it's fair to say that the the search certainly was, was pretty crap. So I think that anything that we would have done on top of that would have been would have been very, very good. Yeah. I think from from our perspective, we we're, were trying to cover off a few things. So I mentioned before that we have we still have a lot of customers that uh, receive a catalog and then go online to to shop. Um and the sort of easy even just from a sort of a transactional perspective where it was saying, right, okay, search by catalog code, search by name. Um, you know, a lot of our products have quite complicated spelling. So we had to have a tool that was quite robust in terms of misspells, uh, obviously synonyms uh, for catalog codes and stuff like that. Um, and also offer alternatives. I think gardening um, is, you know, an, it's an extremely visual um, vertical and um, it's, it's quite a sort of a low barrier to entry. So if you're suggesting um complementary products to people then it's not a great ask for them to add you know another three four five pounds to the basket so we were kind of looking at something that did um all of those things uh that incorporated the um the editorial and written content that we we offer as well because we we really double down on sort of content driven commerce as we call it internally um we look at things like um educational aspirational inspirational so people that are new to garden, it would be how to plant tulips, for example. And we get quite a lot of people that come in to the search, uh, to the website and searching for that. Um, you know, we're also getting people, you know, asking much more, you know, a lot of technical questions um, and also inspirational uh, questions as well. So how to plant a, a cottage garden style or, you know, a Japanese garden style, for example. Yeah. So it had to be a really, really robust tool. Um, nice. I think from a merchandising perspective as well, the merchandising was really interesting because um, we were very, very limited with how we merchandised in the past. So the, the the bespoke platform that we were on before was very much a sort of a drag and drop mentality. You know, it was it was really basic. And one of the main rules that we had is we've got two specific product sets that we would always give sort of up weight to those. And again, those manually. 
But what we've seen is that that in its very self has influenced the buy and has influenced what customers have bought. So it's almost been like over the past 10 years, it's been like self-fulfilling prophecy online. That yeah, it's always been this way. So let's keep buying more of the same. And then people have always exactly. driven towards, because because they've, it's almost like they've been led down a path rather than they've discovered the full catalog and made a selection, if, if you know what I mean. Exactly. So there wasn't really that AI or, you know, machine learning that was actually powering things where yeah. you know, customers had, I wouldn't say free choice, they've obviously got free choice, but it's very much before it was rammed down the throats and say, right, these are the products that we want to sell to you. Yeah. And we'll do the same again next year and next year, and then we'll keep buying the same products and stuff like that. So I think for us, it was kind of opening, being able to open that up to the customer, but also do it very gradually because what we don't want to be doing is influencing the buying habit to, you know, too much the other way where yeah. we've got, you know, where we're completely, you know, sort of um, sideswept by, you know, real popular set of products that we haven't bought for. Um, and th again, this is really important for us because all of our product needs to be grown. You know, we can't ring up a factory to say, oh, well, actually we need you to double up and make more of it. Yeah. yeah. You know, tulip bulbs, for example, are lifted from the ground in you know late summer. And then there's a fine amount in the world. So, you know, you can, you can obviously get them from different sources. But yeah. um, if there's a particular variety that's selling, selling really well, we don't have full control over that. And we can't go make more for that particular season. So it's very much a sort of a gradual. And this will take a few, I'd say, a few years, really, until we start really understanding how that merchandising function has, has benefited the business, definitely. But in, in terms of... Um... One thing that I think, you know, when, when we're looking at search and merch tools or, or you know, like product discovery is a full catalog uh, uh, category because it's it could be an, it could be several tools. It could just be one. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's that as an in-house team, you're always up against it anyway. Like, in, you know, in yeah. terms of how much time you've got, what the skills are in the team, what experience people have got. Um, and I think that, you know, tools, you know, like Clayview, as opposed to, you know, maybe managing it, a, a, you know, a little bit more manual or using like out the box search, you know, it, even just from a time save perspective and and trying to not make sure that, you know, your merchandisers are, are operating more strategically rather than manual labor almost to try, you know, to try yeah. and like categorize everything. Because you've got obviously with, with your products, we've got um, there's seasonality involved, but there's also, like you said, there's, there's just knowledge and information that people might not be aware of or, or certain like pack sizes or mm -hmm. like the different ways to purchase the product are, are quite varied, aren't they? Depending on like who you are and what your persona is or your demographic is. And yeah, absolutely. opening that up to people and educating people throughout the process is quite an important part, isn't it? Definitely. Yeah. And just going, going back to the sort of the discovery process, and you know, going back to the fact that we did choose um, big commerce because of its out of the box functionality, and, and um, you know, there's a lot of time saved in the functions that it offers straight away. Um, we strongly felt as a business that search was something that that we could really take advantage of, yeah. make the most of. I think if if you've got a really really strong search in our industry, um, then you know you you are a few steps ahead of, of quite a few of your competitors. So that was something that we felt that big commerce, um, oh, it was an extremely good uh, platform. It just didn't, it wasn't as robust as we needed it to be. Um, and, and Clavio did offer everything that we needed it to be. So it was a quite an easy, um, you know, business and financial decision to be honest. I heard recently, and I don't know how true this is for a lot of people and maybe people can let us know in the chat, but like, I was under the impression that most people launch with a third-party search tool because that's most of the projects we deliver. There's a there's a third-party search tool, um, and uh, and you know when we're setting up stores, and trying to get to the point where you know we're finalising the discovery and we're you know we're saying what the scope of the project is. Search and merch is obviously uh, it, it's a critical part of the conversation in most industries. You know, uh, nine out of ten probably. Some people aren't going live with with that search tool and then adding it into the roadmap at a later point. Now, would you see a benefit to that, or do you think as a business that just wasn't an option for you and and you you needed a more advanced tool from day one? I think it depends on on your setup within your business. I think it depends on business requirements as well. Um, 
and I think it depends on past experience. You know, for, for me, I've always seen search as a, a huge part of the e-commerce setup. Um, and, you know, obviously I've got a certain amount of budget to build a website and I knew that I could allocate more to get a more robust tool um, um, with, with the money that I had. Yeah. Um, I felt like I, personally, I really need to put a stake in the ground and say, look, you know, we're going from a, a mediocre search, but this is just how powerful it can be. Um, and again, you know, I've mentioned it before, not just from a prop discovery perspective, but from a content discovery perspective as well. Um, and we've seen that, you know, we've seen that um, input from customers that, you know, they've particularly customers that have gone from the old website to the new website. Um, they love the search functionality. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's, what are, uh, I was going to say just, just around like, challenges as you see it since the site's gone live but also when we're looking at like the roadmap and maybe the current state of affairs maybe just fast forward in a little bit to like where where we're at at the moment because i think some of those common challenges and decisions that need to be made in discovery and you know you, it's the same for other other third party tools and, and bringing them mm -hmm. into the mix so it's kind of like a, a e-commerce ecosystem that includes you know your core platform and then the other third parties as well what, what do you think like the biggest challenges a lot of businesses will face if they're replatforming around making those decisions? Do you, do you think it's mainly about budget or do you think it's that they might not get the most out of a tool or, you know, if, if you're using a lot of third parties, sometimes we find clients are using a lot of third parties and maybe not getting the most out of it. Is there, is there any, um, is there any feedback or any comments that you can give around, right? Okay. Now we've got this sparkling new, platform mm -hmm. you know how do you get the most out of it kind of thing i think that's that's a, i think a good point. It's, a, it's a good question and something that we come across because we're only a small team so we're a team of seven some people may have bigger teams some people may have smaller teams i think some of the times the issue with SaaS can be you know you've got sixty thousand sales teams all with different sdks and say well actually you, you can just integrate it like this and you can do this and this yeah uh, and before you know where you are you've got you know a monthly bill that is constantly you know added up over time of all these different apps i think yeah we very much approach it here as a team um and sort of use this methodology in um in different businesses is, is to do less but to do better so you know we 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 knew that search and merch was something that we were going to invest in heavily um and we knew that that meant that we had to pick a, a platform that would free up the time to actually use search and merch more effectively. Um, so what we've done is we've spent a long time over the, well, the last nine to 10 months, basically really getting to know Clayboot. And this can be applied to any other tool that people are looking to integrate that they see as a key business function um, and make sure that my team are really well versed in it because when my, you know, when I try and do my targets for next year, um, search and merch is going to be old news to my board. You know, yeah. they're going to be happy with it, but that's just going to be status quo. Yeah. So, as, as, you know, as soon as you get integrated to a lot of that, I think it's extremely important that anybody who's involved in it gets the sleeves rolled up and, and knows that tool like the back of their hand. Yeah. Because as I said, six months down the line, 12 months down the line, you'll need a new new and yeah. you'll have to find incremental business from somewhere. So we're already now looking to see, right, okay, well, what's the next app or what's the next solution that we will be best that will be best for our business and we'll be able to utilize within our team because you know we've only got a limited amount of resource um so i think that's that's extremely important that's, i think that's always the critical one when it comes to third party selection and even even when it comes to like e-commerce platform as well as well as not just that but the third party tools that go in with it it's kind of like what's the what's the cost or the resource requirement to main, maintain, manage, and get the most out of it. A lot of people might pick the best ESP on the market or like a CDP or whatever. And, you know, they, they don't actually get the most out of it because they've not got someone like over the top of it and owning it. So mm -hmm. yeah, is it is an interesting one where, where clients will pick the technology, you know, but you know, it's the ongoing trying to get the most out of it, which is, which is a big, you know, a big challenge for everyone. Yeah. Just around if we're if we're looking at um kind of your business and, and how the business is kind of looking at the trading period and what seasonality we've got within the business. I know it's 
it's not necessarily a a Black Friday sale type of business going by bulbs and you know by you know by and and you know like kind of what you're planning for your garden and everything else isn't necessarily something that which is a golden quarter uh, decision necessarily. So what's yeah. what's the seasonal peaks within the business and you know like how do you normally approach those seasonal peaks as as a business? Yes, yeah, it's, it's it's actually quite bizarre working as a retailer and not having a busy November and December. So it's uh, yeah. Um, it's yeah it's, it's, it's bizarre but yeah but quite nice so yeah as you quite rightly mentioned not many people are gardening in november um we are trying to mitigate that with new product ranges that we're bringing in um so we just launched seeds for example um which you know offers a sort of a, a, a different promotional marketing tool at this time of the year and at various other points throughout the year when we're uh, traditionally quiet um spring for us is always a big one so essentially mid-march to the second may bank holiday that's the first peak of the year and then you've got essentially august bank holiday up until middle of october so we've kind of just come out of the, the other peak now um so two per year um and yeah the spring one is is a lot busier um because our, our product set is, is slightly different um so from a from a build up to christmas perspective it's obviously it's it's we're not we're winding down but from from a peak build-up perspective um, um for, from our business's perspective speaking specifically about the e-commerce tools obviously big commerce is a platform that allows you to scale so yeah. you know i'd say we're a mid-sized client on big commerce so yeah. we have never ever had any issues in terms of um uh, in terms of volume so yeah we're, we're not a huge um we're not, we're not pushing huge strain on on the servers but you know from our perspective we did um i think a free delivery code which we never we've we've never really done we've never been a hugely promotional business yeah, yeah. from an online perspective um you know we, and we did four times what we would see in an average day um and obviously big commerce as a SaaS platform is it's just kind of nothing to them really so um having that support and that um stability there is is really important and quite reassuring i'd say where sort of clay Vu's fed into that as well from an app um our busy periods kind of go hand in hand with new catalog drops um so it's really important to make sure that we're aligned with that you know any new any new products any new names any new catalog codes uh any new introductions from a products and promotion perspective are sort of piled in to to Clayview to make sure that we're making the most of that app when you know when the peaks hit i think one thing that we do do which is i hope that none of our competitors are on this but one thing that we do do which is quite interesting is that, that because a lot of customers provide a um a similar offering um in terms of products you know you know a variety of a tulip is, is is the same or you get like a a pansy that may have a slightly different name on a competitor so we make sure that any sort of key products as well that are on our competitors are, are, are actually built into our synonyms too um so you know probably giving away a bit of a bit of a secret there but that's that's a key one and that's obviously in, in sort of like holiday holiday preparation um because with any other in with any industry people um you know people use um search uh, as price comparison yeah. it's exacerbated more in our industry because we don't have the traditional sort of price comparison tools because we don't use gtins or uh, upc numbers throughout the industry they're just not really standard right yeah, so yeah. you can't use a price searcher google shopping doesn't really offer a, a, a very close sort of price comparison tool so it's very much a case of right we'll go to competitor a we'll go to jay parkers we'll go to competitor c d and e etc so having that power within the search again is, is really 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 strong when it comes up to building up to those peak periods what's the have, have you already kind of delivered and executed on your content you know your content strategy going into those peak periods do you have any like changes to the plan on the on the site and also like in the blog and the content on the site it, it literally like on like landing pages home pages etc do you you know do you use any variation from that side of things going into peak or do you just try and trade it through in a, in a usual way or is there anything special that you do around the content we've we've got quite um you know our industry is um i don't want to use don't mind the pun it's evergreen basically you know yeah so 
you know, the tulips always come up at a similar time of year. Um, you know, bedding always needs to be planted at a specific time. So it kind of makes our job slightly easier that our trading calendar is is kind of um, specified for, yeah. for you know for the most for the most part. I think what it does allow us to do as well, because we know those trading periods coming up, we can really take time and say, well, you know, what specialized content should we be building? What are our customers looking for in the search, for example? So if we're getting, you know, a lot of search around, um, I mentioned it before about planting tulips or, you know, instructional type of content, we can make sure that if a customer comes to the website, and they're you know on the pdp and thinking about oh you know i'm not too sure whether i should purchase this or not because i've not I've never done it before or you know this is a new product category for me um then we need to be sure to say well actually we've built this content for you this is how you do x y and z so be sure to know that if you if you need any support from a how-to perspective or a content perspective then then jay parker's has, has got it for you um, I think one thing that we, we're doing as well, which is utilizing another one of our, it's not an app because we've integrated it separately, it's so using our CDP. Um, and it's, it's really, really interesting from a, from a gardening perspective because we specify the fact that, yes, tulips come up at this time of year and daffodils come up at this time of year. But, you know, you can speak to some people that, you know, you either like tulips or you don't. There's no real in between. It's not like you're shopping for a jumper and people, you know, you need a jumper. So I'll have it in grey, red or blue or whatever. You like them or you don't. Whereas, you know, in the past, we've always just presumed or never really had the power or capability to say, well, actually, we're marketing, you know, in, in kind of in an arrogance, really. This is where we're selling tulips now. And this is what we're going to market, basically. Yeah. Whereas what we're really looking at and seeing the benefits of is, is utilizing the CDP and saying, well, actually, these customers want crocus, these customers want hyacinths, these customers want daffodils, tulips, etc. And really sort of like amplifying our content um, sort of at scale to target customers on a more specific way. So, so that's been, been really, really fruitful. So just in case anyone doesn't know, CDP, customer data platform, and the yeah. third party you're using um, is exposing you for that. Yeah, yeah, but they're now known as Bloom Reach, I think. But um, yeah, but yeah, when we when we went with them, they were called Exponia. Yeah, yeah. So we've obviously in the in the build, we've done an integration be between Exponia and and the big commerce platform to to kind of pass data backwards and forwards and to try and present a bit more of a personalised experience throughout where we can. Yeah. Um, just on what you were saying earlier as well around like trying to make it in those seasonal areas, you're probably going to pick up new customer, right? So new customer acquisition. Yeah, uh, as you know, as as we're going into those like seasonal times where people are right, right, okay, I'm going to do the garden up, or I'm going to spend, I'm going to each year, I'm going to chip away at it or whatever. So when people are coming through from a new customer acquisition perspective, obviously on the on the on the platform and then the search, what we have tried to do in the search is actually, and again, I think it does really help from a seasonality perspective when new people are coming on is to say, right, okay, what do we do with tulip? So this isn't scripted. I'm going to share my screen. We're going to go into the site. Oh, take a risk. You're going to take a risk here, Jonathan. <laughs> so when when someone when people are visiting the site, obviously they might visit through like via the homepage or like they might land on like a category page or whatever. But then when they go in and they start searching for tulips, we've obviously got if I could spell it right. <laughs> um, we've got obviously offers and products that are that are in there. We've got suggestions coming down the left hand side. Um, we've got content pages, which, like you said before, is informing people. And then we've got category links as well. So when those new customers come in from a, um, from a new customer acquisition perspective, it just makes it easier to guide people in, in the right direction. Yep. And someone's actually, you can see the bottom right-hand corner. I don't even know what that is, actually. The, um, the offer, for, offer uh, widget that you've got on there. Mm. Vicky in the chat, she's asked, is that Power by Clavio or is that another tool? I should know no. this. I don't actually know what it is. So that's actually powered by Bloomreach. That's a web layer right. function that they offer. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's. I think you can you could get this sort of functionality from quite a lot of tools, but we utilize it um, within Bloomreach because yeah. we use it in a very basic way to say, right, okay, well, um, we're just going to show it to, to all if we're doing like a standardized sort of promotion. But obviously, you can use it to uh, target specific audiences. 
So one thing we do look to do is we, we, we send a lot of catalogs out. So we'll look to, to get people to sign up to the catalog and we'll only push that to people that don't have, um, you know, um, a consent for catalog anyway. Yeah, yeah. Very, very basic, but you can utilize any segmentation to push those specific web layers. So you can get really, really granular, but it's quite, it's quite a, it's a very easy tool to use. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that integration helped with that transition from the historic business of a catalog business, as well as trying to trade as an online kind of progressive online retailer. So that, that kind of, that mix is yeah. helping when it comes to the seasonality as well, because you've got different people coming in at different times, but you want to make sure that those loyal customers are coming back and are getting looked after. Yeah. I think that was a really important note as well. Um, we went through a really sort of robust um, RFP with our sort of CD, CDP choice. Um, the reason that we went with Exponia or Blue Reach is their ability to handle that offline customer. So, you know, as I said, we've been going for, for 90 years, which our database isn't that old, but we do have a lot of older customers, you know, for, we, we still get customers sending checks through the door. We still yeah. get customers sending cash in an envelope. So yeah. we have to accommodate that. And, um, I think obviously you've got, you know, you've got the Clavios out there, you've got the Ametrias, which are extremely strong tools, but they're purely e-commerce tools, I would say. And they didn't, they didn't really offer the flexibility that we needed for the, um, for the offline customer, unfortunately. Um, and, you know, that's, I think it's been, been a very fruitful decision. Um, I think we're, we're very, very pleased with William Reach so far as well. Cool. And with, um, just before because what we're going to do is um we're going to move on to q a in a sec i think we'll just cover kind of future plans and, and what you what you plan on doing but if anyone in anyone who's watching the webinar if you've got any questions fire them in the chat and we'll, we'll kind of quick fire through those at the end i'm happy to take questions as well from an agency perspective um or you can just grill jonathan the whole time i'm, I'm okay with that as well um so let's talk about the future and kind of what 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 are the kind of initiatives and what's on the roadmap from um, you know, from Jay Parker's and, and how you're planning on taking things forward. Cause it's obviously, there's like a backdrop now of a, we, I mean, we've been working, we've probably been working together. We were working together post pandemic mm -hmm. in a period of time where, um, or even during the pandemic, um, where, you know, sales are going great, you know, in this home and garden sector, we work a lot in home and garden. We've got a lot of different clients in this area from people who sell beds to furniture, to outdoor furniture, to sheds, fences, like all yeah. sorts. Uh, you know, as well as like interiors as well. So we've seen a lot of clients where you've seen that great amount of sales. Then there's the reality check a little bit <laughs> of 2021 yeah. where you've got, you know, a, a, um, like for like your sales just maybe aren't at the same level or, or in a gradual decline. And then mm. we've got now obviously 22 going into 23 where we're trying to figure out really what's the new landscape look like. So just, just talk to me about that process at the moment and how you're planning that internally because i know with it being a family-run business it's it's obviously um a different proposition to maybe other types of businesses but from your yeah. perspective what does that future growth plan look like based on what's happened and the current economic climate obviously so yeah so we obviously we've uh, we're still family owned and throughout the pandemic we we approached it in quite a conservative way so certainly in the spring of 2020 we were very reluctant to just open the floodgates and let everyone come through an order and i think that stood us in really really good stead because although sales grew you know really really strongly you know the, the company here was very very keen to uh, prioritize staff safety especially in the warehouse um and and also make sure that the customers that are coming through the door were servicing them correctly that level of service is really really important to the owner uh you know not to be the biggest but to be the best um so that was that was great it it coincided with a huge warehouse expansion which we completed at the end of 2020 so 2021 we were kind of better suited to say well actually we're going to go for this and we're really going to push because we've got the ability to do so and we also had um you know the back end of the board to do it as well yeah um i think as we've come out of it we are quite a uh, we are a realistic company and i think you know i can um I can sit here, you know, quite happily and say that, you know, the, the owners have, have seen lots of different things. You know, we've traded through world wars, we've traded through economic crashes, you know, the potential of Y2K, you know, all of these things that have come along the way. And 
the business takes a very very realistic and conservative approach to business which you know I, i'm i'm not naive to know how lucky i am in my role to to have an owner that yeah. understands that um but i think the you know the the basis is that the basics that we've put in place the foundations that we've done over the last two years and, and launching the new systems this year you know we've we've come off the back of you know a, a year we were basically seeing three to four times the revenue rates that we've seen two to three years ago and we've come out of that and nestled in you know really quite comfortably uh, above pre-pandemic levels um we're not going to get to 2021 but at least you know not in the not in the near future um but everything that we're putting in place at the moment is is getting us closer and closer to that so there are a few weeks where we're actually trading up on 2020 and 2021 as right. realistically we're probably slightly behind but you know i think the business is really surprised by the performance um what it has done is it's you know we we spent quite a number of years not really doing a lot of proactive marketing both online and offline um pre-2019 anyway because we didn't really have a suitable website to drive people to so there's a lot of focus next year around acquisition um of, of new customers pushing the brand out more yes. um which i think is going to be a real key focus for us as i said we've got that that secure and sort of um well you know we're quite proud of the platform now that we push people to we've mentioned before that we've got a b2b side of the business which is very often overlooked because it's a small percentage yeah but it's very profitable and the you know if you think the customers are loyal in the retail space if you can you know service a you know business very well then they will keep going back and spending a lot of money so we're just about to complete i think this is the last week really of dead build isn't it with with you yeah. guys on the b2b site yeah so we've got bundle b2b installed we've got clayview operating on that a completely different different function as well it's you know it's it's not pure b2b we've got a hybrid of, of larger retail customers on it but you know we service schools we service prisons are probably our biggest customers may surprise people stately homes royal estates we've got lots of different customers that um big commerce and bundle b2b are going to allow us to offer some real exciting functionality to um so that's obviously a, a big focus from a from a business perspective and just improving things proving things all the time you know I mentioned it very briefly, but our, our sort of tagline within the business is not to be the biggest, it's to be the best. Yeah. We're not going to have the, you know, the PE backing of some of the the bigger boys in our industry. We, we, we're not never going to have that, and there's not really that aspiration to to go for that top level growth without sustainable profit. The companies have been profit every single year that's been in operation, so that's something that's really really built into the cornerstone of the business so we may have you know quite quite big plans um for next year but they're always rooted in a in a sort of a sustainable way uh, to, to build the, the business profitably uh, yeah i think that's refreshing because a lot of a lot of people now at the moment where they're they're kind of looking um you know they're looking at plans i think having that more slow and steady approach for me especially when it comes to like building a technological roadmap or a digital roadmap for any clients that's what we try to do as well is you know there are always those high priority items and those things that you want to get done as soon as possible but the things mm -hmm. that have the biggest impact generally take the longest time so yeah. you know it's i definitely think that e-commerce roadmap building and like developing um, developing long-term sustainable roadmaps for clients is based on incremental gains generally and then it's only when you introduce like a replatform or a like we're replatforming dutch bulbs um which is a, a separate site to the to the main site so we've got that kind of separated store which is just a b2b store but it's also got clay on there it's got other other third-party tech on there as well so that enables us as a business to then say right okay well that's quite a that's quite a um, significant change in the landscape whereas for most businesses if you're on a platform if you're already on big commerce or if you're on other other platforms or whatever it's then just a case of saying right okay well how can we incrementally improve in the roadmap um, and and then go from there so yeah, yeah it's, it's good to have that more kind of calm approach i would say or like a slow and steady approach to, to growth because there isn't necessarily one silver bullet in e-commerce is this it's always like a sum of all the parts isn't it i think one thing as well that really gets overlooked and 
one thing we're quite keen on doing here um, is investing in staff. So, you know, we've got quite a small team, um, as I mentioned before, but we've really invested in, you know, their progression, their training, um, their compensation. Um, these are people that power, you know, the main revenue driver for the business. Um, and, you know, they're, you know, the, the, they're using these apps day to day, the power in the website, the power in the, you know, the merchandise and functionality, the power in the marketing. And I think, you know, losing sight of that is, is actually the biggest, um, I sort of say, um, delay in, in growth in digital for me, because if, if I take one of those people out of my team, it's, it's, it's a nightmare, you know, because yeah. we're a small operation. That's, that's the idea behind SAS that you try and keep your team quite slim yeah. and use, use apps to, to, to sort of bolster, um, resource and functionality where, where, where applicable. Um, but not investing in your staff, I think, is is, is extremely short-sighted. So that's something that we've, we've focused on this year and, and going to build that into to next year as well. So, um, yeah, I think that's really positive, positive thing to do. Cool. Well, um, yeah, I'm just going to go into some of the questions that have gone into the chat now in the final final section, uh, if that makes uh, if that's all right with everyone. Um, right, okay. So one of the – I know this guy, actually, Mark Dunbarren. Nice to see you on here, mate. Um, how have people found using Clayview with a headless setup? Um, I, I think uh, that question was kind of answered by Claudia from Clayview in, in the chat. There are some, there is some documentation there, on, you know what the API coverage is and, and everything else. It, we've we've implemented Clayview JSV two on on Jay Parker's and with a couple mm. of clients as well. And I think it's quite a similar setup. Um, I'm not sure exactly what the setup would be, but I think it would be quite a similar setup to JSV two where um, the the Clayview product, where you've you've got the kind of older Clayview product, which is around, um, you know, from from a, a few years ago, that that is a little bit more locked down with regards to what you can do on the front end. Where we found that with Clayview JSV two, actually, we can as an agency we can customize whatever we want to to do with that. We haven't actually got any sites live uh, to talk about with headless and Clayview on there in the tech stack, but we do have a few in the pipeline. With regards to you know how that might actually work and how we would implement that, I'd definitely refer to the documentation uh, that Claudia shared in the chat. Um, Mark's also added in there that you know it's good to know your customers. So um, if you can track how they shop without an advanced search, you can then gauge how something like Clayview or, or other tools might then advance it. So I, I definitely see an argument for that. I'm, I'm all for kind of testing and learning and learning from the data as, as we go along. Um, Rihanna's asked, um, are all the category pages powered by Clayview? Um, so I'll, I'll fire that one. To, I know the answer, obviously, but I'll fire that one to you. Yes, they are. Um, so, yeah, we, we power all our PLPs with Clayview. Um, second that question is optimize whole categories based on the individual use activity. We don't currently do that. Um, and uh, Paul, you may be to advise, you may be better to advise on personalization within categories. Yeah. It's not something that we do at the moment, no. Yeah, the, the personalization in the categories, it depends what your preference is, depends on the suite of products that you use within um within Clayview. So there's a there's a couple of different products that are available and the personalization engine in there also can power product recs um to kind of bring the suite together. I think one point around the category merchandising is we do it is it is using I think with a lot of tools it's partial it's mainly AI but there is some partial manual intervention for for some clients like for example saying that you want to boost products which are best sellers to the top or push uh, downgrade I can't remember what they call it but they like downgrade the 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 kind of ones that are out of stock for example so yeah I think whether whether like from a strategy perspective sometimes it depends what the client wants to do um because one-to-one -one personalization on a category page might not be the the best strategy for them uh, you know from a merchandising perspective most of our clients say let's use partial ai and partial like this is what we know is a bestseller or this is what we want to push from a business perspective so i think it's you I think it's getting the right balance, but you know the team at Clayview and whoever your agency is will be able to work through that with you about what the options are. I think mm -hmm. also it's good to split test those rules. That's that's also a good feature where you can you know you can split test um, 
ways of working or ways of merchandising for A versus B and see which gets the most sales over a period of time. Um, Laura Bradbury, she, she asked the question, which platform did you use previously, previously and what was the biggest benefits of big commerce in comparison? Um, we covered a bit of that at the beginning, Laura, but Jonathan, do you want to just cover that at a top line, you know, the um, previous platform and then the biggest benefit of using big commerce? Yeah, so essentially it was um, a very bespoke platform. The company that we used, they'd started life as almost like um, quite popular in the early noughties. So their sort of bread and butter was transitioning catalog based companies to an online operation. So rather than building an e-commerce store, they were taking how people shop through a catalog and then building a platform around it, if, if that makes sense. So by all intents and purposes, it was extremely outdated. Um, we had very, very little um, ability to change it. Um, I don't, yeah, I don't really know. Essentially everything improved. Um, so it was, <laughs> it was, yeah, it was like, um, like a ray of sunshine overnight. Yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was quite powerful just how everything changed so quickly. Um, you know, users being able to access um, all parts of the back end uh, from an SEO perspective, what we could do there. Um, just, you know, the, the ability to um, uh, edit creative and content and everything like that. So, yeah, so I'm not lying when I say every single thing improved. So yeah, it was a no brainer for us, definitely. Yeah, I think from an agency perspective as well, or uh, if you're still there, basically we we feel that from from big commerce platform perspective, we can, you know, it has the the customization flex, like a lot of flexibility, like we've historically experienced with Magento, but it doesn't necessarily have the overheads or the technical uh, debt as an you know like as an agency and also with our clients, where it actually costs money to maintain, manage, update host you know support all of those things are kind of taken care of in most SaaS platforms so you can really focus most of your attention on customization or the roadmap or front-end enhancement so you know it's less on managing the software and, and more on like progressing it so from our perspective we feel like the agency spend is more progressive and, and more into um you know benefiting the platform rather than maintaining the platform which is which is a good balance Obviously, we're agency partner of the year with Big Commerce for the last two years, so I'm going to say that. But um, <laughs> we, we're, um, I, I'm a big fan of Big Commerce just in general. I feel like a lot of people that move to it are kind of like, like you said, Jonathan. I remember when it went live, and you were like, "It's just much easier. <laughs> Everything's just easier because you don't have to worry about these things being broken in the background or these kind of gremlins in the background of historic kind of legacy tech." So, I'm a big, I'm a big champion of it, and you know, yeah. as, as I said, I like Shopify, but even when people say, you know, when you get, get into an argument with one of my friends quite regularly about Shopify versus big commerce and, you know, he's very much in the Shopify camp and very much in the big commerce camp. But yeah. I think either platform would be, you know, the, I'm, I'm, I'm very much SaaS based rather than, you know, a tool like Magento or something like that. Yeah, I definitely think that's, that's, that's certainly the, the trend in the industry. So if, if, if you are managing your own software, you know, you have to have a decent in-house team. So yeah, it's, just, it's the comparison, isn't it? Um, Gerard Smith. Hi, Jonathan. Thanks for the insight. There you go. Got, got, a, rave, got a rave review already. Um, some good shared learnings um, that will be useful for many, I guess. Um, oh, listen, listen to your desire to grow. Looking for a partnership opportunity um, for B to mutual B to B opportunities. So yeah. you say, please contact me directly if of interest. So there you go. I, I, I can put my email in the chat if anybody has any other questions about. Yeah partners that we've mentioned here then please feel free to contact me obviously um I'm, I'm not paid or you know got my hands behind my back or anything like that but if you want honest answers then i'm, I'm more than happy to uh, to send them through and arrange a call if you if you've got any more questions last few questions then so vicky's asked how many of your team are looking after claving um so we've got two at the moment but i'd say you could definitely do it with one based yeah. on the size of business that we are we do too because one is more senior um and then obviously the junior person comes in and covers um but yeah two primarily rihanna's asked another question in there when it comes to boosting products or giving products a score is this a manual process or based on learnings um the 
<laughs> God, just seen that. Very good. Um, so correct me if I'm wrong, Claudia, uh, from Claybu, but there's basically three scores that go into product boosting. You can do one manually. One is, uh, the other two are from AI. Yeah. I can see that someone from Claybu is typing, and I can't yeah. remember which one is which, but essentially you do have full control over it if you want it. Or you can also let the computer do, do all the work. But I'm pretty sure that Clave will have quite a lot of reading material about it. I've certainly read through it before. Yeah. So as long as you've got it within their uh, documentation, then. Um, with with our clients, they have different rules per category as well. They can do things. You can do things in different ways depending on what the category is. Like you're new in, you might want to merchandise that in a completely different way. It's like a core best-selling category or whatever. So. Yeah. Um. Okay. And then last questions now uh, before we wrap up. Um. Is the whole catalog collection of products powered by Clayview or is big commerce um product queries and um is big commerce the product queries part and part Clayview for the queries? So basically search is all powered by Clayview. PLPs yeah. are all powered by Clayview. We have the products all within the big commerce platform, and that's essentially powered by our ERP, uh, Microsoft Business Central. So essentially, if you had a PIM, it kind of operates as a sort of a, sort of a, a lighter version of a PIM. Yeah. Um, so that's that's kind of how how we structure it at the moment. So yeah, search and PLPs uh, powered by Clayview. Everything else is big com. I think the critical part about that is making sure the data is right because a lot of the clients that we work with, you know, they want an advanced search and merge tool, but the data is a bit of a mess. So it's kind of like how can you have you know the various facets and the various rules and all the different things that you're going to then set around merchandising just make sure you spend time you know tidying up your data in advance of going into any of those third parties otherwise you won't get the most out of them as well yeah i think that's just one thing as well to consider is that if you operate on a business as variants so you have a master product with variants whether it be size color etc just make sure that you are testing the sort of the data ingestion from your big commerce tool to, to Clayview. It may sound like bread and butter, but um, that's something that we spent a long time doing to make sure that the correct information was pulling through, uh, both from a sales and um, um, and, and another metrics perspective. So if you've got variants and not just master products, really invest some time in testing it. Yeah. Um, okay. I think last question then sorry last one's coming in now uh how does clavy work on other e-commerce platforms like magento and shopify um i think it works in a in a very similar way but i think um claudia <laughs> yeah there you go she said the same so we've got a couple of clients on magento and shopify that use clavy so when you're in the actual console and how it all works is quite similar the implementation is slightly different, um, but I think now that we're in that JS, most of our implementations are JSV2. In fact, all of them, I think, are JSV2 now for, for anyone that has Clayview. Um, we would generally generally speak and approach that in, this, in the same way. Now, how long does it take to implement it is slightly different on each platform. So there is a variant there of, I'd say, maybe 20% from from a, uh, not just from, a, not from a design perspective, but more from a build and implementation perspective. So like we would we would experience slight variance between those uh, three platforms that we work with on Clayview, but generally speaking, it's in the same ballpark in terms of time. Cool. I think that's pretty much all the questions answered. Um, so yeah, I think we're gonna wrap up there if that's okay with everyone. Um, thanks very much, Jonathan, for your time. Uh, that was really- Hello. Thank you. Thanks to everyone for attending as well. And listen to me draw on for an hour is probably not the best. Yes, constructive use of time, but hopefully you found something insightful. Good to get participation and lots of questions like that. So yeah, that's actually made it quite fun for us <laughs> rather than yeah. me just talking <laughs> to each other. Um, so yeah, thank you everyone. That's really good. Great. Cheers, guys. Thanks. Have a great day. Thanks, guys.